Hi, everybody. Thanks, uh, thanks all for joining in. If you have any other meetup ideas or some area you would like to see a presentation, or even if you would like to have a presentation in our in our uh, GDG group, feel free to contact us. It's a it's a really good exercise. Uh, for today, we are going to talk about GraphQL. It's the third meetup with the guys at Hasura. We had a really good communication before, and uh, hopefully, we'll have some more meetups in the futures. In the future, uh, in the last moment change, Adron couldn't join us, and today's presentation will be delivered by Pravin. But I let him present himself. So, Pravin. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so today, um, I'm going to talk about uh, how GraphQL fits into this whole front-end and back-end ecosystem and uh, what are the different moving paths and uh, and so on. So um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I am Praveen. I work as a developer advocate at Hasura. Uh, I'm, I work full stack across both front-end and back-end and obviously slightly powered by Stack Overflow for CSS stuff. Um, so my journey has been from uh, jQuery to React, um, like a pure uh, front end with jQuery, JavaScript written, and moving to like a, a single page apps using React, state management and stuff. So that was a transition that I took on the front end side. And on the back end side, um, I moved from like a Django MVC architecture to like a Node.js, uh, like a full full blown JavaScript uh, back end, right? So that's another transition on the back end side. And obviously, like packaging apps and deployment um, was was purely Docker. So all of this happened. The transition for to to React and Node.js and Docker happened uh, almost along the same time, uh, probably around 2015, early 2015, when all of these started to become uh, popular. Um, then comes in GraphQL. Uh, so this transition was important because um, if you if you look at the the technologies that have changed on the front end and the back end, um, different libraries and different programming languages have dominated. But uh, on the API side, um, uh, you would have noticed that it's it's just primarily REST APIs. Uh, and GraphQL came in uh, came in 2015, but uh, it it got picked up a little later. And 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 primarily, uh, even now, I think uh, like REST API still dominates the whole uh, API layer. Um, and 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 the transition hasn't been there on the on the API calls that you make from the front end, or or you make or you just create it on the back end, right? So so that layer has been constant uh, despite the different changes that have happened in both front end and back end. So that's interesting. Uh, and 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 what what GraphQL lets you uh, do is is like build apps faster. Um, and and that's what I've realized when I moved from like. REST APIs to GraphQL uh, in the process, right? Um, and and GraphQL generally it solves like the key bottle API access. Uh, the reason being um, data is like in different sources, and and with GraphQL um, you have like a single endpoint which unifies this data uh, and makes it easy for for consuming it on the client, right? Um, GraphQL also like um, makes you move towards like a self serve API, uh, self documenting um, with the, like a schema and a type system. Uh, it it gives you it gives the front end developer like a full power uh, to to isolate themselves and uh, develop uh, an application. Uh, previously, it used to be like a front end developer will go to like a back end person for for any API changes. Uh, now the GraphQL API is already like uh, pre-compiled for you, and um, and 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 because of because of the documentation that's uh, auto-generated for you with GraphQL, uh, with the schema and type system, this is more like a self-serving API and and whatnot, right? And with GraphQL, you're not restricted to like one shape of data. Uh, obviously, with REST API, you can do the same thing, but uh, because it's tied to like a single endpoint. Uh, the general uh, expectation would be that you are probably uh, restricted to shapes of data, but GraphQL lets you do flexible uh, shapes of responses and queries as well. So you can do nesting uh, and and get all the data in one particular uh, query, right? So 
So shapes of data doesn't really change uh, when you're moving to GraphQL. And as I said earlier of uh, about the bottleneck of getting API access, uh, GraphQL makes it easy for you to uh, like combine multiple data sources in, in a single place. The, so this change uh, is more visible on the front end side of things. Like as a front end client, when you're exploring the API, uh, you're probably making a single query, which is uh, nested and, and you're probably getting data from multiple places in the back end. And it's not really completely visible for the front end person, but uh, everything is happening in the background and it's all like uh, made pretty easy for, for the front end person, right? So that's, that's another uh, angle to look at when you are adopting GraphQL. And the whole user experience with GraphQL has become uh, the adoption point, right? Uh, the whole tooling around GraphQL uh, with with user interface tooling like GraphIQL, GraphQL Playground, and the whole uh, because you have a schema and a type system, uh, you can build like concrete tools around it. And even on the front end, you have caching solutions which never existed in the REST API world because you you never know what the data structure is uh, of course you can add typescript and and like you ha you you have a type system enabled for your front end apps but that's uh, that's still not solving the underlying api layer being typed right now that you have graphql with a typed layer uh, the more uh, the more coupling you have with uh, with what can change on the front end right so so it's all connected with with the types and that that helps build tools which helps the user experience uh, grow better right so now the question would be like why graphql at all uh, right so uh, so if you look at the consumers of of today uh, you have like different platforms and different kind of apps like you have the mobile apps and web apps and like microservices and third party apis and vendors uh, so there are multiple uh, consumers who wants data access and, and if you look at the compute layer, the infrastructure, that's getting a lot easier. Um, the writing business logic and, and like uh, writing serverless stuff, uh, the tooling around it has become easier. And consuming data is the actual uh, bottleneck now. So you need an API to, to communicate with some, something, uh, some database or probably some uh, third party service and then get back some data, right? So the consumers, are uh, are that there are multiple consumers and they all want to access data uh, through an API layer um, and 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 the platforms are different and you have different API services running as well, right? So data access uh, for all of these different platforms takes a lot of time to build and iterate on, uh, primarily because uh, each platform, like a mobile app, will require lesser data, uh, web app will require like a larger data set, right? for the same kind of functionality let's say like, let's take a product page uh, or an e-commerce site uh, the mobile view probably might not show all the fields uh, that are uh, there in the product table but the web app can actually uh, has the ability to show it because of the size that it uh, has so uh, and and also different services might require different kinds of data for different reasons like a reporting app uh, for the admin interface will require uh, different kinds of data so uh, the same product table uh, is being uh, accessed in different ways uh, by different platforms so building apis for this uh, takes a lot of time and uh, and that's the bottleneck right now that we are trying to solve um and if you look at the producers of data uh, you have uh, databases, uh, typically like your Postgres or MySQL or MongoDB and, and so on. Um, and you have other internal services, which lets you like build uh, custom business logic and authentication and, and different kinds of uh, SaaS services, uh, which lets you uh, do like payments or like search, let's say Algolia. Um, you have like Stripe for payments and, and PayPal and so on, right? So there are a lot of external services and APIs, which also produce data and which also stores data for you. And, and there are internal services like your auth service, which stores user data uh, and so on. And if you're using external service like Auth0 or, or Okta and so on, you will uh, or Firebase for that matter, you will have the user data isolated in that service, right? So, uh, so data is also like scattered across different places. Uh, and consumers are also different, and each consumer wants different sets of data from, from all of this, right? Uh, 
Um, so writing an API layer for this varied set of use cases uh, is going to be a challenge. Um, and in fact, if you look at the database layer, uh, like with all the cloud infrastructure, uh, with like standard uh, Google Cloud SQL or, or RDS on Amazon uh, or Azure, uh, the infrastructure part is actually taken care of for you because of the nature of the cloud infrastructure that's being taken care. Uh, so databases are getting better uh, and, and scaling is not the fundamental uh, roadblock for you to get started. Uh, you have all of these serverless functions on the consumers and like uh, cloud uh, databases on the producer side. And, and so then that's, got, that's gotten sorted. Uh, so you still have to solve the the fundamental data access layer, uh, right? And and this is where GraphQL comes in, uh, pretty much uh, to solve this problem. With REST APIs, uh, for example, you need to write probably multiple API endpoints for your mobile app and web app uh, for a same uh, fetching product use case. The reason being that if you're still writing one endpoint and uh, your web app is is getting that information. The mobile app is probably getting more data than what it is supposed to get. Okay. Um, mobile app didn't require five fields, uh, but it's still sending that data, and that's a lot of uh, kilobytes being transferred. All right. So, uh, so, so that is a problem. That is a problem that uh, Facebook wanted to solve with GraphQL, uh, um, and because uh, they their mobile apps uh, had to become uh, pretty lightweight. For the data access that that it that it requires, so you so, so the Facebook mobile app had to fetch exactly what it wanted rather than rely on what the web app really did. Uh, the web app obviously showed a lot of information in the newsfeed and whatnot, but the mobile app showed a little lesser uh, amount of data for the view that it was showing. So that's the reason why Facebook built GraphQL in the first place, and that's how this whole data access layer is now uh, now uh, being solved by GraphQL itself. Uh, so you fetch uh, what you want. You, you there's only a single endpoint, GraphQL, and and different shapes of data is also possible. And also you can communicate with different data sources, uh, which is like the database and your services and whatnot, right? So, so that's why that's how GraphQL fits in uh, as the middleware where uh, everything is taken care of. Uh, it solves a lot of these problems which existed, right? Um, so is it a comparison between GraphQL and REST? Um, no, because they both exist together. Um, the reason being that um, REST APIs have a lot of existing tooling, uh, including like monitoring and a lot of legacy tooling that's been there, that's been built around REST APIs, uh, the errors that, that you capture through all of these network calls and status codes and whatnot. Uh, like a 200 is a, a successful response, 400 is a bad request, 500 is a error, gateway error, and so on, right? So there's a lot of plenty of tooling being built with the REST APIs, and that's not going away anytime soon. So REST APIs are here to stay. What GraphQL offers is, is a layer over REST API uh, for, for the front-end clients to become more powerful uh, and, and purely uh, just to make it convenient for of front-end developers and also like on the back-end side, uh, you can now uh, build APIs in silos um, you, because of the schema and the type system. Uh, and you can merge the schemas once different teams actually build their own versions of uh, schemas, right? So, so it's not about GraphQL versus REST, it's always GraphQL and REST, right? Um, and on the challenges side, uh, on the developers, with GraphQL, there's like a performance and caching problem that needs to be solved. Uh, with performance, uh, with GraphQL, you have this whole N plus one problem when you're writing your own custom resolvers. Um, so by resolvers, I mean, uh, so if, you're new to, if you're new to GraphQL, resolvers are basically just functions which, uh, which gives the data back for the query that you've made, uh, for the fields that you've made. Uh, and and the problem with that is if you're making a nested query, uh, let's say you're fetching authors and the and their articles, for each author you have to fetch their relevant articles. So this becomes like an n plus one kind of calls, and and this is not really performant. Right? So uh, the other option is to obviously build like a compiler which uh, compiles this into a single SQL query or a single API call to an external service which lets you do this. So that's a problem to solve on a generic level. On the caching side, 
Uh, there's obviously front-end caching that's there with GraphQL. But on the back-end side, because uh, it's a single endpoint, it becomes a problem for caching, right? With REST APIs, you can say that uh, this particular get endpoint can be cached. Uh, so you have get slash product slash one, um, and you can say that this endpoint can be cached behind a CDN, and uh, the responses will be pretty fast. But with GraphQL, you have a single endpoint, which is a post endpoint, and, and everything is actually in the request body of the JSON, and, and you cannot cache that, right? So now we have to look into the request body and then figure out a way to see if this is the same query that needs to be cached. So, so the existing tool will not work out of the box. The existing CDN tooling, uh, which is there for REST APIs, will not work for GraphQL. So you need to build something new for caching on the back end for GraphQL, right? That was challenge that needs to be looked at from a developer's perspective. And authorization, um, which is generally generally a problem with uh, even REST APIs, right? Um, uh, like you will have to uh, allow permissions for for fetching different kinds of data and and GraphQL is no different and we still need to solve that problem uh, at the fundamental schema layer. Uh, but with GraphQL, what uh, you have as a benefit is the schema. Uh, the schema lets you actually now uh, target specific field types uh, to be able to 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 be able to restrict those fields for certain kinds of users and so on. So you have like roles. these fields in the schema, right? So authorization is kind of um, like you can you can do it still better than the rest APIs because of schema, but it's still something that needs to be solved, uh, right? Now the operation side, uh, because of the single endpoint, there is a single point of failure. Uh, if your graphical endpoint goes down, your entire application is down now. With rest APIs, if one endpoint goes down, probably the other endpoint is running on a different service and it was probably working. So now, with a single point of failure, you will need to have different rollback uh, or like a, a step down approach of handling things. So that's another problem to look at. And how do you do rate limiting with GraphQL, right? Uh, with REST APIs, you know that this particular endpoint uh, can be uh, rate limited based on an IP or based on a user ID and so on. Uh, with GraphQL, because again, it's another single endpoint, uh, you cannot rate limit that whole endpoint for the entire public, uh, right? Uh, so again, it goes back into the request body of the query and see uh, how do you do rate limiting for this kind of uh, a query. On the business side of things, uh, like what's the cost involved for uh, adopting GraphQL? Um, so if you're starting a new project from scratch, uh, I would recommend GraphQL. It's probably going to give a uh, lot of benefits for front-end developers and and probably ease of maintenance on the on the backend side. But if you are migrating away from REST APIs, um, you'll have to rethink because there's a lot of cost involved uh, on the business side of things. And and the way to approach that is to do incremental adoption to GraphQL uh, by writing a GraphQL wrapper over REST APIs and then slowly migrating your data layer. Uh, right and, and all of your APIs with authorization layer coming into GraphQL, right? And um, and this is this is where I wanted to introduce Hasura uh, because it solves a lot of these problems that I talked about in the challenges in the previous slide. Uh, so what does Hasura, uh, what does Hasura do uh, and what has changed with Hasura 2.0? So Hasura is basically like a GraphQL layer uh, that communicates with databases and gives you uh, GraphQL APIs um, and and Basically, Hasura connects to data sources and, and gives you like GraphQL and REST APIs out of the box, right? So with 2.0, uh, um, what has changed is we've announced support for multiple databases. So now Hasura can connect to Postgres, uh, MySQL, uh, BigQuery, and SQL Server, and so on, right? So, so it can connect to all of these. like create REST APIs on top of GraphQL. So this might sound a little uh, weird because we were talking about uh, moving away from REST APIs to GraphQL. Uh, now, what is this uh, move, creating REST APIs on top of GraphQL, right? This is primarily a use case where uh, uh, like large large companies uh, or, or existing tooling uh, 
which is being heavily used uh, for 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 any kind of purpose, like let's say monitoring or caching and so on. Uh, those tooling will work only on REST APIs and and what we can do with GraphQL uh, with auto generated GraphQL API is that you can define like a GraphQL query and then map it to a REST API and and use that REST API from your front end and 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 avail the benefits of caching, rate limiting, and all of this for free with the REST API tooling. Right, so that's another feature that has come up from 2.0. And like a generalized authorization layer. Uh, so if you're writing an own GraphQL server from scratch, uh, you have to define your own authorization layer previously. Now uh, with Hasura, what you can do is uh, you can have Hasura as the layer authorization for all of your GraphQL servers, including the databases that you uh, connect to with Hasura, uh, and also like establish uh, relationships between, right? Uh, and, and and the relationships bit is the, is the is the is the name generalized joins where uh, let's say you write your own GraphQL server and there are like two of them and you want to like join data between them right um, for for example you have an auth service uh, which is in GraphQL which has users data and you have orders uh, the e-commerce orders that are being placed uh, which is in probably in a Postgres database and you want to merge these two uh, data based on the user ID, right? Um, and you can do that now uh, if they are two different services as well, right? So you can now join data between all of these services uh, irrespective of where they're coming from. This is also possible because of the schema. So you have a schema with uh, with GraphQL and you can technically like do a generalized join, right? So how does Hasura fit in your stack? Uh, the, previously there was a monolith uh, where like developers used to communicate with the monolith and monolith used to talk to different services. Uh, think of like your MVC architecture. Now with Hasura, developers use a GraphQL interface to contact Hasura and then Hasura makes like a query to the data sources, depending on what the query looks like. And then um, there, are, there, are, there are asynchronous events that happens in the background as well, where there are micro functions which can be run, which can be triggered based on some database events. Uh, which can be triggered asynchronously for different use cases, right? A simple example would be like uh, you sign up uh, and register a user. Uh, the user information is stored in Postgres, but uh, you also want to now trigger an email to be sent, like a welcome email for the user to be sent uh, a little later. It's not a blocking action on the UI. So you want to like, send an email uh, to the user, right? This can be an asynchronous uh, webhook call, like a serverless function call, which can be triggered whenever there is an insert into the user table. So these are called events. And Hasura lets you configure them declaratively and then configure a, a book URL, uh, which can be triggered, right? So, so it's more like a CQRS style, uh, command query style, asynchronous uh, eventing. And, and the different databases that we support, as I said, men, as I mentioned before, like Postgres is the key uh, because that's where Hasura stores your metadata about where, where you store all of this information. And, and SQL Server support is there. We have MySQL and Alpha and BigQuery with, with the read-only support, right? Coming soon would be Oracle, uh, MongoDB, and, and more databases, uh, and more flavors of Postgres as well, right? Um, uh, different flavors like Citus DB and... Cool, so on the front-end side, um, what, is, what is the current status of GraphQL uh, and uh, what are the future challenges, right? The client tooling uh, is, is a key, component of front-end for GraphQL because of the schema, uh, you have this tooling like Apollo, uh, Urkel, and, and a lot of these clients, which lets you consume these APIs pretty easily, especially the subscriptions part, which I love. And, and also let, it will also give you like a full-fledged caching solution on the front-end uh, with the schema that you have, uh, which lets you prevent making multiple queries to the database, to the, to the API layer, uh, once you've cached some data on the front end, right? And there are also like fluent GraphQL clients, which lets you write queries as objects. Like for example, you have like an ORM kind of a, a querying layer on the front end, uh, let's say users of uh, one and then dot where uh, some filter and then uh, do a sort by order by something, right? So you can do a chaining of these objects uh, with, uh, with GraphQL queries. So that's like a pretty good use case as well. If you want to write like Novarum style query on the front end, the challenges on the on the tooling again uh, comes to uh, how you adopt 
uh, like web sockets for, for subscriptions? Uh, how do you like actually do caching? Uh, or does your front end client replace your existing state management solution, uh, which you've been using on your, let's say, a React app or your Vue.js app? Uh, does it replace your existing state management solution or, or your new uh, API layer is just like a data fetching layer and not actually uh, the state layer, right? So that's a challenge that needs to be solved when you're uh, writing front-end apps. So I'll quickly go over a backend demo um, and uh, we'll quickly see what it takes to build like a graphical API. Um, so this is Hasura Cloud. Um, this is free to try it out. I'm going to create a new project on Hasura Cloud uh, and connect it to a database. And then uh, we'll let you know I'm going to say GDG dev create project. So I've created a new project on uh, US West region. And uh, the graphical endpoint, if you look at this, so there's a graphical endpoint that's been generated for you automatically uh, under the project name that I've created. And uh, right now, that's, this is the metadata that you need to know about. So once this is initialized, I'm going to click on Launch Console. And once this loads up, let me zoom in this a little bit. Oh, the screen is visible. Right, so, uh, so this is the UI uh, that you typically get with the uh, Hasura project. Uh, just uh, an improved version of the GraphQL interface for you to try out queries uh, and like a data layer to manage your databases. Uh, so think of it like as a PHP admin, like an improved version of that, right? Uh, so what I'm going to do here is like create a Postgres database for us to quickly try out some queries of GraphQL. Um, so this is already connected to my Heroku account. Uh, Heroku has a free Postgres tier that I can create and then connect it to my Hasura Cloud project. This is doing that for us right now. So once this is connected, uh, yeah, it's already connected now. So now we have this Postgres database. It's added, uh, and I can actually now browse the schemas that are there in this uh, database. I'm going to create a table called users, and let's say an auto implementing ID, and like a name column with type text, and let's use some timestamps or frequently used columns. I can leave these foreign key unique keys empty and I'm gonna click on create app. Right, so now we've created this table. Um, so let's look at some audience and then insert some row. I'm gonna add Florin and I'm gonna add Tadu. So we have a couple of users now that have added uh, from the audience list. Now let's go to API. Now, if you look at this on the left, the Explorer, we have the query that is auto automatically generated for you. So you have this users uh, and you have the ID and the name column and the created at uh, columns come appearing over here. And as you, you're getting this autocomplete uh, ready, right? So let's click on play. Um, I have some variables, right? Let's click on play again. And we've got the data from uh, the database. So this is the users that we created uh, right now. And we've got that data from the query. Uh, and this is the GraphQL interface, which is uh, pretty neat, which lets you do some autocomplete. Then you press command space, sorry, control space. Um, and let's say I want to do insert users one. I can now insert another user name, let's say Adrian. And I, in return, I can get back the ID and create it, right? So this is the typical GraphQL mutation. That's that's uh, the structure of that. Uh, you, you call a node with the object and then you return some fields. Right, so um, I'm going to insert this. So we have gotten back ID three and the created at timestamp for this user. Now we can also browse this by going to data and looking at the users table, and we have the new user which is inserted. Now 
this is all postgres uh, this this is just a ui over postgres you can technically use your uh, postgres tooling uh, your database tooling generally your psql command line tools or even php my admin and so on so this is just another layer to browse and and manage uh, that data pretty easily you can export and stuff right so uh, so the api layer is the important layer we have query we've tried out queries and mutations uh, the next bit would be subscription where I have users and I get the ID and name and create that. It will give us three users right now. So let me actually go to data. And, and in fact, what I'm going to do is do an order by ID and descending to the limit one. So um, stop this. So this will actually apply some filter and limit one. So always give us, gives us the latest user who has been created. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the console and insert another user. Let's say, and save. Now, if you go back to the API Explorer and if you look at this data, this has changed to ID four and the new name, right? So what's happened is this is a subscription. This is a live query. This is uh, continuously listening to the changes uh, in the database. And whenever there is a change, it, this is the response gets pushed to the front end client. And uh, this is pretty useful in building like a real time app, like your order placement, uh, your food tracking and, and so on, like your tracking, any uh, geo tracking and so on. It'll be pretty easy to build with this kind of a subscription uh, based model, right? And on the front end, it's pretty easy to consume as well. Um, the whole WebSocket experience has been uh, made easier uh, on the front end with, with clients like Apollo and Oracle. And that's that's why I think uh, the back end with Hasura, like which gives you subscription out of the box and like a good front end integration, which lets you consume it easily will make a good user experience uh, with, with GraphQL, right? Now imagine building this with REST API uh, on the back end, you will have to like build like a whole WebSocket uh, connection or use tools like socket.io. And on the front end, you need to set up like a client uh, for WebSocket, which will be initializing the whole WebSocket connection and stuff, right? So it's, it's a little pain to manage and also the state uh, management around that would be uh, even more painful, right? So uh, so this is uh, going to make this uh, make everything a lot easier. Uh, we've tried out queries, mutations, subscriptions, uh, and uh, quickly let's actually also look at uh, relationships and so on. So I'll create another table. Um, let's do this and do incrementer address, say line one of the address, and Let's tag it to the user ID for the time being. And uh, let's hit in code. And let's do text there as well. Um, we can do parallel key ID and click on active. Right. So now this user ID column is uh, is related to the user's table, right? Uh, we need to add a constraint that ensures that this is a user ID value. So I'm going to add a foreign key constraint called uh, users for the user ID to ID. I'm going to click on save. This is a typical foreign key constraint that you do with any database, any SQL database, right? Um, so I've created this foreign key. Now if we go to relationships, uh, this suggests uh, like an object relationship that you can create. And let's say I create this, I save this user and now what this lets us do is, let's say I entered a new uh, address, let's say a sample address, and I tag it with user ID one, and let's say pin code one, 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 one. Let's save. Right. Now what I can do is I can now query users ID name, and I have to create the relationship. So let's go to users and create a relationship. And now uh, this will be like a one to many. Uh, for each user, we'll have multiple addresses. So this will be an array relationship uh, that will be created. 
So what I can do is I can call the addresses, ID, sign one, and pin code. If we look at this query, the ID name and also addresses, and then there's a nested query for addresses, which asks details for the addresses. And and this is a nested query, and 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 this is all like a single SQL statement that has been generated uh, behind the scenes. So if you look at the analyze uh, button, and if you look at the query that's generated, it's a single SQL statement uh, which has been compiled, and you you see the execution plan on Postgres, right? So so however nested the query is, uh, it's all compiled to a single SQL statement, which is executed in a transaction, and then you get back the response over here. So this will solve the n plus one problem that we had earlier, and uh, and the whole auto generation logic for uh, for mapping your database tables to APIs will solve a lot of user experience issues uh, in building an app uh, backend. And and finally, uh, before we take some questions, I also want to show like permissions. So let's say I create a role called user, and I want to be able to allow only the user to be able to select their own data. So I can restrict them by saying ID equals to like a session variable, which comes in from your token. So you have access tokens in your authorization headers, and you will have some claims uh, in your JWT, for example. And, and this will be the value of the user ID that will come in from those claims. And now you can filter that value with the, with the value in your database column, right? So. So now that's the checking. That's the check that I'm doing here, and I'm going to allow access to all these columns and click on save. Right, so there's a role called user, which has been created to allow restricted access for selecting data. Right, so let's test that out. Uh, let's uh, remove the admin secret, or in fact have the admin secret, and then add the role accessora role user. And X Asura user ID would be one. Right? So if you look at this, it says addresses cannot be found, uh, cannot query because we have not given permission to fetch the address column or address table for the user role. Right? So I'm going to remove this. I want to click on play and we get just, just the ID one. And if my claim value in the token had two, it would have given me two. So this is basically a filter that's getting applied. Uh, at the SQL layer itself, right? So if you look at the SQL query, uh, the var clause itself is generated based on the access token or the, the token that you use for the authorization header. The values in that claim will be uh, will be used as a SQL filter uh, so that you will not be able to fetch uh, other people's data based on the permission setup that you've done, right? So, so the authorization layer is automatically taken care of for you. Uh, so this is just basically configuration stuff that you have to do where you go to permissions and then you declare uh, permissions for different roles on what they can do and how many columns they can fetch, uh, whether they can insert, whether they can update and what not. Right? So the permission layer uh, can be taken care of for the entire GraphQL uh, API that you create and you also have connect to databases, right? So, so that's, that's fundamentally our permissions. Um, do I have more time, Adrian? Yes, I think we can go on for like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. Awesome. So uh, yeah, to quickly uh, go over a couple more features then, I think uh, would be around uh, custom business logic and like a remote schema. So what does remote schema mean? Uh, so if you're writing your own GraphQL server, you can now add them as a remote schema because uh, not everything is a one-to-one -one mapping with your database, right? So there are use cases where you will have to fetch data from a different source. And and probably you, even in this database structure, you might want to do some custom business logic, right? In this case, you would want to like uh, make your own custom server written for all of these logic. And, and let's say if that is a GraphQL server, uh, you can use remote schemas and then you can add them as, as a remote schema over here. What Hasura does is it will actually merge the schemas uh, with what's already existing. So currently the schema will look like this. There's queries for users and whatnot. 
and your remote queue might have let's say products or orders and what not they'll be merged and you can also establish relationships between users and products and what not right uh, so that's that's remote schemas um with actions what you can do is it's pretty interesting because uh if you have a rest api which you want to now expose as a graphql api you don't need to rewrite the whole portion into a graphql server what you can do is with hasira you can actually define your graphql types let's say type query and type mutation uh, depending on what whether you want to fetch or insert you can define these types and then um, you can map it to like a webhook handler like an endpoint which is a post endpoint that uh, you will be able to handle uh, in your rest api so what hasira does is it sends these input arguments to your uh, post endpoint and and let's say you already have a rest api which is uh, doing some data fetching for a different use case and you want to expose that as a graphql api uh, for example um, i'm just going to do a type query and let's say fetch products and let's say it accepts the id as an argument let's say the type is int and let's say the output type is product output or remove the input type over here and we'll rename this to product output and let's say the product output returns the name of the product and say the price um which let's say it's string for that for right now and and i can actually now map it to a handler which let's say this is this is just my local uh, host and endpoint uh, so i'm hosting it on docker uh, but what will happen eventually is your you can now start making a query for fetch users i'll remove the row user make fetch products and i can let's say give an id and i can get the price back obviously this is going to fail because the connection doesn't exist the rest api doesn't exist but uh, when you're making this query uh, your rest endpoint will get the argument id 1 as like a post request body parameter that you can process and and that's all uh, you can now do all sorts of logic data fetching in your rest api that you've been doing already uh, and then return a response in json uh, which will be mapped as a response over here right so that's a uh, that's a neat way to like uh, incrementally adopt the graphql when you already have like a rest api uh, you don't need to rewrite the entire logic uh, you just map you just add some types for your graphql api uh, and then you actually just map it to an endpoint which accepts a post uh, request most likely you would have probably uh accepted a post request for for an existing use case and uh the only change over here is the request body format uh, is slightly different uh whatever hasira sends you is probably slightly different from what you've already built for your client so that's a small change in the transformation of the data once you have done that in the initial layer uh everything becomes uh the data fetching layer becomes just reusable like everything is already there for you Uh, so you've con- you've converted your rest api to like graphql right so that's uh and so you can define permission for the user role and so uh so despite your code logic being in a rest api or near custom server uh you can define relationships and permissions uh with the centralized uh api layer with hasura right so that's the that's the benefit of using actions um and with the remote schemas you write your own graphql server with actions you write your own rest api uh, then map it to graphql schema finally um, on the events uh, as i mentioned before in my slides uh, like a specific use case where a uh, user register to uh, a user table for example like create a uh, send email trigger uh, and i wanted to trigger it only on users whenever there is an insert into users table i want to call this webhook url right 
the use cases uh, to listen to user inserts into databases and then probably send a message on Slack or probably um, send an email, welcome email and whatnot, right? So you can do all sorts of these uh, things with these webhooks uh, by listening to uh, operations on the database, right? You can listen to updates, you can listen to deletes, and then like trigger something uh, with a webhook, which will let you do any kind of custom logic. So this is a post uh, REST API endpoint. Inside that endpoint, you can do whatever you want to, like you can trigger a notification, you can trigger an email, you can send a Slack notification, whatever, right? So it's, it's totally your logic, your code, any language, any framework, uh, and that's applicable even for actions, right? You require just a post endpoint and it could be in any language or framework that you write uh, the custom logic in. Uh, typically, uh, events being asynchronous uh, is recommended to be in like a serverless function so that it's easily scalable and then it sleeps when you don't really make a query, uh, consumes lesser uh, infra and like consumes lesser price for you also, right? So that's the change. Uh, that's the feature for events. Uh, you also have scheduling. So you have like cron, uh, which you typically set up on your uh, machines for like executing on uh, on a given interval. So you can like execute like reports uh, on a weekly basis. You want to send an email uh, every Sunday night or whatever. You can build that kind of a cron schedule, just building a cron expression and then calling a webhook at that particular time, right? So this is also possible with this uh, interface and then so on. So. So that's uh, that's all I wanted to share uh, on on the backend side. I think the final slide. I think I just wanted to show you folks on the learning resources. So this would be uh, so. This is on hustler.io slash learn. Just gonna zoom in a bit more. Yeah, uh, and so we have like a bunch of tutorials for you to get started with. Uh, so if you're a front end person, uh, we have all of these frameworks. Uh, like the React, Vue, Next.js, TypeScript, whatever framework they're using. We have like a full-blown tutorial to build like a real-time to-do app uh, from scratch. You'll be using like a Polo client uh, for these frameworks, some of these uh, some of these languages. Uh, for Android and iOS, probably a bit different. And and uh, this is a front end. If you're on the backend side of things, you can try out Hustler tutorial, um, which uh, the ones that I've covered so far in, in and are also like some, some advanced stuff on the back end, right? So this is a good resource for you to get started. There's also like an introduction to GraphQL if you're completely new to GraphQL and then some code concepts uh, for you to get started with, right? So, and these are all open source. You can contribute to them uh, and try out the apps and whatnot. So that would be nice if you can, if you want to like follow up, follow on like a building an app and then learning something, this would be like a nice place for you to get started with, all right? Yeah, I think that's mostly it from my side. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to post it on chat. Happy to answer. Yeah, thanks, Praveen. Uh, until further questions are, are posted, I have a small question, but I think I already know the, the answer. I noticed you played the round with uh, Heroku Postgres development DB. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you if I want to play around with uh, Hasura Cloud, do you guys have a free tire just to play around, play around with it? Or is it, uh, yeah. So if, yeah. Let's say if, uh, Someone else uh, watching this this talk have want to play around with with the Hasura Cloud. Can we do that? Yeah, yeah totally. So uh, it's free to sign up on Hasura Cloud. You don't you don't need a credit card and and so on. So uh, that's like you can create free projects on Hasura Cloud, uh, like how I've done. Uh, so there's a free tier that you select, free forever, and you select a region, uh, which is currently right now restricted for free tiers to be US West. And once you set up once you set up a project. Uh, what you add over here is totally under your control. Uh, so I have done a free Heroku database, but this database can come from anywhere. Like if you, as long as you know the connection string, which is hosted somewhere, you can add that and then keep using the database uh, as it is. Uh, again, if you looking to just play around and then try out stuff, Heroku is, is a good option because it's a free tier and, uh, and it's pretty easy to like connect to Heroku database and create a, a quick connection string, right? And 
So whatever I've done right now is all on the free tier for both Hasura Cloud and also Heraku. Uh, the, the smaller restrictions, we want to keep using free tier in the sense of how many API requests you can make uh, over time. Uh, so there'll be like probably smaller rate limiting uh, in, in, in using a free tier, uh, but, but you can definitely try it out uh, and even build very small apps and, and so on. Yeah, cool. Want to... And you get the perks of using like uh, using Azure Cloud. You get the perks of like, uh, getting a monitoring for free. Um, so you can now trace how many queries have been made to your application, what kind of graphical queries being made, and how do you do rate limiting and so on. So this would be like the interface that you get for free, uh, even when using free tier. So yeah, yeah, that's that's really cool. Uh, one one other question from my end. Uh, so, when you add Hasura, basically there's a new there's a new level in your in your application. Uh, what's the performance impact, so to say? So, have you guys done some comparison between uh, I don't know some APIs with uh, with Hasura and uh, other APIs from, I don't know, Node or Django or something else. Is there a, a performance cost associated with this? Right. So, so the so the way Hasura works is basically, um, uh, let's say your front end app, right? You're making a query. Let's say you're making this particular query. Um, what Hasura is doing is basically translating this into a SQL statement, and and that takes milliseconds. Uh, so, so whatever time uh, it takes for Hasura to transfer this into a SQL statement is the actual latency that you have. Uh, and tra like transforming, compiling a graphical query to SQL statement is is the is the only bottleneck over here. And once it is transferred to SQL statement, it's sent to Postgres as it is, and Postgres gives back a JSON response because we're using JSON aggregation underlying. Uh, and that's just being split out into the response for the user. So the bottleneck is actually uh, more on the database side of things uh, than on the API layer, because uh, the only step is actually converting this query into a SQL statement. And that's that's like barely milliseconds for you to uh, convert. And, uh, and it's also optimized for performance. The SQL statement that is generated uh, is has been optimized over the last two three years of this whole development product, and it's and that's the that's the layer that we uh, we rely on, and uh, we believe in the performance of that SQL generation logic. Uh, with regards to comparison between other frameworks, I think it also depends on how your Node.js server uh, is returned to fetch the data from um, your database. Uh, will you be able to like now write a compiler which uh, generates a single SQL statement uh, uh, for a, for a nested query? For example, I made this particular query um, for a Node.js server to make an optimized query for this, as well as uh, just fetching users and name uh, would require a lot of logic to be written, and probably the performance of that would not be as good if you unless you've written. Uh, I spent a lot of time doing that uh, optimization, right? So, uh, so this is the layer that we uh, we rely on, um, and 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 I think, uh, and also with Node.js, if you're writing your own uh, logic, you will probably end up with with an n plus one problem, uh, most likely, unless you are writing a compiler yourself. Uh, in which case, you could you might as well just use Hasura or or any of these compiler tooling, uh, right? So. Um, so yeah, on the performance side, we've never faced a performance issue, uh, and the bottlenecks have been around uh, adding read replicas for Postgres or scaling Postgres using a variant of Postgres to distribute and and so on. So that's why we're adding support for Citus DB, um, and and there's already support for Yugabyte and and so on, right? So so the 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 bottleneck is actually on the on the database side and and much less on the API side. Okay, that answers my question. So if there are any other questions from from the other participants. So how many of the participants are new to GraphQL? I should have asked this question. 
uh, the beginning of the talk, but uh, if if some of these uh, you couldn't relate to, I think uh, probably in a different day on a different talk or probably the resources that I've listed, you can learn about the GraphQL stuff, the introduction based on the core concepts. That'll probably make you aware of what I was talking about and relate to it much better. So, Had uh, we had a meetup where we played, we actually built a, a, a full scale application in using Flutter. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of years, I think two years ago, because last year it was everything paused. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of us, I'm not really sure, some of us actually played it back then with, with GraphQL. Awesome. Some so uh, at least some some basic knowledge I think uh, most of most of us have. Right. Yeah, and I think like the query layer itself is intuitive for to quickly pick up uh, on the GraphQL side, like and with the GraphQL interface, um, it's pretty easy to try out queries and mutations and stuff. So um, that layer should be probably very familiar for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, on the Hasra side of things, if you're not familiar how Hasra fits into your ecosystem or um, or how do you actually get started with GraphQL for uh, on the backend side of things, like if you want to write your own server, there's a lot of things that you need to worry about uh, rather than how you typically do your REST API stuff, right? Um, so that could be something we can probably talk about on a different day, but yeah. Basically, when you're writing your own GraphQL server, you need to worry about uh, the resolver solving for performance, n plus one problem, caching, and uh, and also worry about sending the right response for different platforms depending on the query. Uh, and authorization layer, which is like a big problem to solve uh, in terms of configuring permissions easily and then sending a query with uh, the authorized response. That is all being taken care of with Hasura because it's all declarative and uh, even the SQL that is generated is is authorized with the permission layer and, and so on. So, so it saves a lot of time. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to replace your entire backend. Uh, for most of the query logic, Hasura will will take care of uh, the auto-generated ones. Um, so 60 to 80 percent of your application code is already been reduced with all of this auto-generated APIs and the authorization logic. The remaining 20 to 30 percent is something that you will have to write for your custom stuff, uh, including events and actions and remote schemas. There's always going to be some custom logic that needs to be written in any application, and that's where you you choose your own language and framework, and then add it to the Hasra layer, and then and you get free permissions and relationships also. So, yeah, it's going to solve a lot of use cases for uh, for backend developers. The aim is to reduce backend code as much as possible and give the power to front end people. Okay, thank you, Praveen, right. for the presentation. I think if there are no more questions, uh, we can conclude here and We'll get in touch. Yeah. Thanks for joining in, folks. I think I hope it was useful for everybody. And uh, yeah, Let's see you around. Okay. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Bye bye.